Hi, and welcome to today's webinar. Before we introduce the speaker, I just want to make a couple of brief announcements. I know many of you are listening in from far away and can't attend local events or programs, and that's one of the main reasons we do these free webinar series. We do host multiple webinars per month, so please visit our website to view the current 2016 schedule. But we are always adding more webinars to the series, so if you're not on our email list, I encourage you to visit our website and click on the Join Our Email List link that appears on the homepage. To get instant news and events from the Johnson Center, you can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter, as we often announce grant and scholarship opportunities, research opportunities, and last-minute events and presentations there. You can find links for those on our website at www.johnson-center.org. And for those of you who are nearby, we invite you to attend our annual Halloween Open House on Thursday, October 27th from 3.30 to 5.30 p.m. There will be trick-or-treating, games, allergen-friendly treats, costume contests, and more. It's a lot of fun, and it's also a great chance to practice for the real event a few days later. It's free, you just need to RSVP, so watch for the invitation on our social media pages or in your email. Be sure to follow our colleagues at the Autism Research Institute, as they also host their own webinar initiative, and they share some great resources on their website and social media pages. Before we begin today's presentation, please do note that questions may be typed into your control panel throughout the presentation, and time permitting, they'll be addressed during the presentation. Also, for those of you who have requested copies of the presentation, we don't send out the slides, but we do post recordings of all our free webinars on the Johnson Center YouTube channel. Please search for us on YouTube and subscribe to get full access to all of our recorded webinars. We are offering certificates of attendance for this webinar, and a link to complete a short quiz will be emailed to you one hour after the presentation concludes. If you want to make a note of the link now, it is tinyurl.com slash specialeducationrights. Again, you'll get that in your email one hour after the presentation. Once you successfully complete the quiz, you'll be able to download your certificate. So now please welcome today's presenter, Dr. Claire Shitty. Dr. Shitty is the staff psychologist here at the Johnson Center, and she brings her expertise, compassion, and understanding to all she does here, whether it's completing assessments and diagnostics, running sibling camps, or working on her research projects. Please welcome Dr. Shitty. Hello everyone, thank you for joining me for today's webinar, Know Your Rights, Making Sense of Special Education. This presentation was put to, together by myself as well as Amanda Tammy, LPC BCBA. I wanted to start off with this comic here. Um, when I started learning about educational law and special ed, I felt pretty overwhelmed. Um, I can imagine, as many of you are parents, that you felt the same and can relate to this comic. And really, I hope that this presentation is either um, additional information or can start you on the path of understanding more, because really the more you understand about special ed, the more confident you can be in understanding it and advocating for your child. So I hope that this presentation will help you in this process and you'll feel um, stronger standing up to um, everything that special ed can entail. Today's presentation is going to be a broad overview. Um, so I'm going to be talking about special education and laws that are related to it. I won't be able to cover all laws, um, there are so many that would take several presentations, but I'm going to point you in the direction of resources at the end of the presentation because I know that everyone is likely coming from unique situations and you have unique questions pertaining to your situation. So I encourage everyone um, to enter in questions and if I don't get to everything, which I likely won't, um, we will be able to develop a blog post to cover some topics, additional topics and questions, as well as potential future webinars um, if there is enough interest in certain areas. I'm going to start off our discussion on talking about the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act and eligibility for special education. First off, we're going to be talking mostly about federal laws today. However, it's important to be familiar with your state laws as well. 
Um, states can have different laws pertaining to special education. They can mandate more protection, but not less. Um, so if your state provides more protection, that can trump certain federal laws. So again, look up your individual state's um, laws regarding education and special ed um, and be familiar with those because you may have more rights than even federal laws provide. The two primary federal laws that we're going to be discussing today are the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or IDEA, as well as Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. IDEA, or Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, is the federal education law that requires schools to serve the needs of students with disabilities between the ages of 3 to 21. Basically, it's a law that governs and provides the right to special education. In the IDEA, it was last updated in 2004. There's four basic rights that I'm going to review that are part of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. The first of these is FAPE. F-A-P-E, which stands for Free and Appropriate Public Education. Each child who has a disability will receive a free and appropriate public education. That's basically what FAPE means. Another basic right that's part of the IDEA is the least restrictive environment. So education for the child with a disability will occur in the least restrictive environment or setting. And we'll have a discussion of that um, in future slides. Another basic right that's part of the IDEA is regarding evaluation. Schools must evaluate children who are suspected of having a disability to see if they're eligible for services, as well as provide re-evaluations. Another basic right covered under IDEA is for related services. So these are services that the student might need, such as um, certain types of therapy, like speech therapy or occupational therapy. Schools are obligated to do all of these things that I just listed. Let's talk about eligibility for special education under IDEA. To be eligible, the child must have one of the disabilities listed here. Additionally, the disability must be impacting their academic progress. This is an important point because not all children with one of these disabilities will receive special ed. It must be impacting their academic progress and be determined to be impacting their academic progress via an evaluation. However, if a child doesn't meet eligibility under IDEA, they may qualify for services under Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, which we're going to be discussing in a minute. But again, the key determination is whether the disability is impacting developmental progress. Now, I also want to point out that all of these labels up here of the different types of disabilities um, are considered educational labels. These are different from clinical diagnoses that a private clinician might diagnose. For example, the term emotional disturbance is an educational label for a disability that might encompass um, diagnoses such as a mood disorder or bipolar disorder. Um, also, there's the educational label of autism. This might include autism spectrum disorder. So again, these are all more educational labels that the school uses to define a disability. This is a great flowchart that um, kind of reviews the general special education process, especially starting off. So the first step is a referral to get evaluated. This can be made by a parent or the school. And then the evaluation 
determines eligibility. If the child is eligible, an individualized education program is developed which guides their educational placement and instruction. And this is all reviewed in an IEP meeting or in Texas this is called an ARD meeting. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, this is also the general process for reevaluations. Um, so there, it's not a one-step process. The child must be reevaluated, and their special education program must be revised according to their growing needs. So this process can happen not just once, but it should be should happen at least annually. And I'll talk more about timelines related to that in the presentation. So as we just saw, once a referral is made, um, a full individual evaluation is conducted, or an FIE, to determine if the student is a student with a disability and qualifies for special ed and related services. Um, the FIE also helps develop baseline levels of performance and a starting point of um, what goals should be made. The FIE should be completed 60 calendar days after parental consent. Consideration of what a day means may vary from state to state, but typically it's school days. Um, and for example, in Texas, it's actually 45 school days that the evaluation must be completed. So again, um, look up your state laws to see if those are different than the federal laws. A variety of tools and strategies should be used as part of the FIE to gather functional, academic, and developmental information, including standardized tests, observation, and information from the parent. So the evaluation should be comprehensive um, and measure all relevant areas of functioning and use standardized tests. I would recommend um, if your child is being evaluated for the first time to familiarize yourself with um, the evaluation process and a basic understanding of standardized tests and tests and measurement. Um, we have some previous, evaluate, or previous webinars that cover this topic that you can access on our YouTube channel and there's also information about this and understanding evaluations in some of the resources that I mentioned at the end of this presentation. As part of the evaluation process, existing evaluations and observations should be reviewed as part of the evaluation process. So if the child has had a private evaluation, particularly recently, this should be included as part of the evaluation. Sometimes schools will actually use test scores from a recent evaluation as part of their evaluation and they may not redo certain testing that was done outside um, as part of the evaluation. Like I mentioned earlier, it helps identify present levels of performance or baseline levels of functioning. A child should be evaluated at least every three years and earlier if it's deemed necessary or if a parent requests it. Reevaluation should also be done before determining that a child no longer qualifies with a disability or no longer qualifies for special ed. So a child can't just be pulled out of special ed without completing a final evaluation. When a parent first consents to the evaluation and the process is started, a copy of their procedural safeguards, which is basically parental rights that are part of the IDEA, should be given following consent to the initial evaluation and also every year afterwards. We're going to be talking at the end of the presentation about um, what the specific procedural safeguards are. One important note that I wanted to make regarding the school year is if you have concerns about your child and are wondering if they would qualify, try to consent to an evaluation as early in the school year as possible. 
If requesting towards the end of the school year, look up your state's laws regarding when the evaluation must be completed if the school year is approaching summer break. Um, in some states, you may have to wait until after summer to complete the evaluation if you're too close to that cutoff. Um, it, but in other states, it may be different. So be aware of those timelines. Um, and just an, another important note that I'm going to be making um, throughout this presentation is the importance of providing requests in writing. Many requests have to be in writing, such as consenting to the evaluation process. Um, but it's good to just keep a paper trail of your requests as well as to request um, other changes that the school's making in writing so you can keep track of those as well. And this is a right that you have if, as parents is to request things in writing. An important right that parents have regarding the evaluation process is the right to an independent educational evaluation or also referred to as an IEE. If a parent disagrees with results of the school's evaluation or their determination of the school's educational evaluation, you can request an IEE. Um, this is one of the procedural safeguards that you have that's covered under the IDEA. Um, typically, this independent educational evaluation is paid for, paid for by the school. And parents can have a choice in the private evaluator who completes the evaluation. Oftentimes, schools will have a list of um, private clinicians that can do the evaluation. However, parents don't have to choose from this list. You can choose your own private um, psychologist or evaluator to complete the evaluation. Um, the school will then contact the clinician and set up a, a contract with them for the independent educational evaluation. One thing to note is that results of the IEE will be considered but not necessarily accepted. Um, so it's good to have this independent evaluation. However, it doesn't mean that the school will automatically accept the results and use that in in, as part of their um, special ed determinations. So we've talked about or gone over an overview of the IDEA and eligibility as well as um, completing evaluations that determine eligibility. Now we're going to talk about IEP and 504 plans. If you remember that slide I showed several slides ago that shows the general flow of um, the special ed process, once the evaluation has been completed, it's reviewed and determinate, determination of eligibility is discussed in an initial IEP, which is an Individualized Education Program, or ARD meeting, um, which is the term used in Texas for um, admissions review and uh, dismissal meeting. Um, but basically, it's a discussion of whether or not the child meets eligibility and what will be included in their individualized education program. This meeting is made up of a variety of different people of several different roles. And these roles include school administrators, parents, general education and special education teachers, and someone who is familiar with the evaluation process and results. <clears throat> if a child is eligible for special ed, the IEP program is reviewed. There's typically a timeline indicating when this meeting must be held after completion of the evaluation. In Texas, for example, it must be held 60 calendar days after the evaluation is complete. We're going to be discussing the Individualized Education Program, or IEP, and I want you to think of the IEP really as the heart of special ed or your child's special ed program. 
Any student who's deemed eligible for special ed gets an IEP. There's a few things that I want you to keep in mind to keep in mind regarding the IEP or ARD meeting. When a meeting is scheduled, parents need to get at least five days notice of the meeting so that you can try to attend. You also have the right to request rescheduling of the meeting or being able to conference into the meeting. You'll be asked to sign to show that you participated in the meeting. It's good to know that you can sign to show that you participated without agreeing to the goals and services. You can take the IEP home to review and return it. At the ART or IEP meeting, you'll be asked to sign the IEP. Once you've signed it, the school can begin implementing the special ed services. It's important to know that you can revoke uh, your decisions later. IEPs are reviewed once a year, at least once a year, but if a parent or a teacher believes that the student isn't making progress or has already mastered their goals, another IEP or ARD meeting can be scheduled. If you want an IEP review meeting, it's important to put your request in writing and send it to the school or the district administrator. Really, this meeting is your chance to ask questions and to voice any concerns or disagreements that you have regarding your child's IEP. Um, so it's important to prepare for this meeting as much as you can and to feel confident expressing your child's needs, asking questions, and disagreeing if you disagree. As I said, the IEP is kind of the heart of special ed. It can also be thought of as the blueprint for special education services. It's important to note that special education is not a designated place where your child will go. It's a set of services. Many people think of special ed as a special ed classroom or a setting that the child goes, but special ed broadly means it's um, a set of services. Um, so again, the IEP is the blueprint for the student's free and appropriate public education. And it includes several different things, um, such as present levels of performance, um, annual goals, as well as objectives and benchmarks that will help measure progress towards those goals, as well as related services. And we're gonna, there's also other things that are included in the IEP that we're gonna get to in a few more slides. Um, now I'm gonna walk us through what should be included in a good IEP and how goals should be written. The IEP, again, will include present levels of performance. Information about these can be obtained from that full individual evaluation as well as from teachers and parents. Um, but it includes present levels of performance regarding academics, such as how the student performs in mastering expected skills for each academic subject. Um, it should consider the student's academic standing in each subject and how the student's disability affects involvement and progress in the general education curriculum. Present levels of performance should also relate to functional um, type skills. The IDEA doesn't specifically define what's included in functional performance. Uh, but basically it describes these as skills or activities that, are, that include activities of daily living and independence related skills. Um, so you want to determine how does functional performance affect their performance in the general education curriculum. So here's some examples of present levels of performance. I'm not going to read all of these out loud. 
Um, but one thing I want you to note that we're going to get to in the next slide is how each of these examples are things that someone would be able to observe and measure. And present levels of performance, again, are going to cover academic areas as well as functional areas. <clears throat> so one important thing to be aware of is how IEP goals should be written. A good way of remembering how they should be written is thinking of um, SMART goals. So you want the goals to be written in a specific manner. They should be measurable and observable so that they can be measured. Goals should be attainable, relevant to the student, and time bound. So all of those different areas, the present levels of performance, the annual goals, as well as objectives and benchmarks should follow all of these goal setting rules. They should have a very clear way of determining whether or not the student has met them or not. And remember, as parents, if they're not clear, if you feel that the goals aren't written well, ask that they be written, rewritten. And remember that you do have the right to disagree with goals. So here's an example from the book, Writing Measurable IEP Goals and Objectives. This is a great resource by Bateman and Ayer. Um, and this is an example of present levels of performance, objectives, and benchmarks that will help get to this goal. Um, so as you read through this to yourself, Notice how, again, this example follows those SMART um, steps. And again, I would encourage you to access resources such as this book or some other resources that I'll mention at the end um, for how to write effective IEP goals. Um, oftentimes goals are written too broadly or vaguely and it's really hard to measure or track progress. Um, so it's good as parents to be familiar so you can ask that goals be rewritten more specifically and in ways that can be measured and that are relevant to your child. Another part of the IEP um, is the least restrictive environment. According to the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, each child with disabilities will participate with non-disabled children to the maximum extent appropriate to the needs of that child. So they should be placed in an educational setting um, that is the least restrictive. So we're going to talk about what those settings might be and more specifics about this. So what the school will consider is how they can provide the student with a free appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment. This means that the goal is always to educate the student alongside students without disabilities in the general education setting. And the IEP should describe how this will be done, specifically how this will be done. However, sometimes the general education setting isn't the most appropriate placement, so the IEP also covers what alternatives are more appropriate. And it should describe the extent to which the child will not participate in the gen ed setting. So this pyramid depicts the possibilities of different educational settings. And as you can see, um, as you go up, it's less and less inclusion in gen ed. Um, so it might be general education with in-class support. The child might be removed from gen, gen ed for less than 40% of the day. They might be in a self-contained classroom more than 40% of the day. The child may attend a separate special education day school or a residential treatment center. 
An important fact related to this is that appropriate and free and appropriate public education, it simply means that it meets and is tailored to the child's individual needs to provide meaningful educational benefit. Appropriate in terms of the school's goals is not to provide the best or maximize the student's potential, it's simply to effectively educate the student. Um, for example, the school doesn't have to provide services that they don't offer to other students, like paying for a private school if the parents think the private school is a better fit, or creating a specific program for the student that doesn't already exist. Again, it's simply to effectively educate the student. Um, but whatever the school deems appropriate, they must make this happen, such as funding a day school or a residential treatment center placement. <clears throat> also part of the IEP is what services and accommodations will be in place to allow the child to succeed in the least restrictive environment. This might include things like transportation, speech therapy, occupational therapy, social skills group, extended school year services, physical therapy. Um, these are just some examples of related services. But in the IEP, it should indicate when services will begin, how often they'll, they'll have them, and how long. Um, transition services should be included. Um, starting at 16 years or earlier. Uh, related services would also include behavior management and challenge, challenging behaviors interfering with the student's learning or others' learning, as well as assistive technology and accommodations to succeed in the general education classroom. And we're going to be talking more about accommodations as they pertain to um, 504 plans in a moment here. Section 504, so we're moving on from the IDEA and special education and what's covered under that, including IEPs. Again, individualized education programs are part of the Individuals with Disabilities Act. A totally separate law is Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. Um, this law allows students to get the accommodations needed to access the general education curriculum at the same level as their peers and basically access a free and appropriate public education. Again, Section 504 is not part of IDEA law. Um, instead, it was created as part of the Americans with Disabilities Act to protect the rights of people with disabilities and programs that receive federal funding. So when I say programs that receive federal funding, it's not just educational programs, but Section 504 also applies to colleges and the workplace and other settings. Um, 504 applies to students who have physical or mental impairments that really limit one or more major life activities, such as their activities of daily living, speaking, hearing, seeing, seeing, breathing, learning, working, as well as additional areas of functioning. The school must evaluate a student to determine that they have a substantial impairment to be eligible under this law. It's important to know that it's easier to qualify for a 504 plan than an IEP. For example, a child might not meet eligibility um, under the IDEA, but they may under Section 504. It's also important to know that parents and students have fewer rights and procedural safeguards under Section 504. Um, furthermore, there's no legal requirements of what should be included in a 504 plan, and it actually doesn't even require a written plan but certain districts or states may have different policies regarding whether it must be written. Another difference is that parents don't need to be invited, invited to the meeting to develop the 504 plan, but parents must be notified that a plan has been developed. So again, Section 504 is another avenue for receiving services, but there are 
um, different rights available for parents and children under this law. A 504 plan, it provides students with accommodations to help them access and succeed with the general ed curriculum at the same level as their peers. Um, basically accommodations, you can think of it as kind of leveling the playing field compared to other peers. A good example of how accommodations work is let's think about swimming as an example. Some people are very strong swimmers and some aren't. For those who aren't, there are some different tools and equipment that you can use to help you swim as well as strong swimmers, and this might be things like a snorkel, flippers, floaties, and access to these different tools, it levels the playing field so that as a weaker swimmer, you can do as well as the stronger swimmer, and this is how we can think of accommodations. The same idea applies to school performance. Some students are really strong, Others have substantial limitations, so a 504 plan can help provide accommodations such as um, a note taker, outlines, extra time on tests, being able to take a test in a low distraction environment, large print textbooks. These are all just some examples of accommodations that the school can provide that kind of allow children that have impairments to access the gen ed curriculum at a level with their peers. I want to provide this swimming example to kind of show the difference between accommodations and services. We talked about related services as they pertain to an IEP, um, but an IEP, again, can ensure provision of the same accommodations as a 504 plan, but also it can um, indicate what services and modifications to the gen ed curriculum can be made. So back to our swimming example, let's think about someone who doesn't know how to swim at all. Even with all of that equipment and accommodations that we mentioned, they still wouldn't be able to succeed if put in a pool, so instead the person might need to be taught how to swim, which is a service. Services are typically only available through an IEP. It's possible to qualify for services in a 504 plan, but this is really rare. Um, so again, we went over some examples of direct services and supports. Um, again, it could be a variety of different therapies, one-on-one -on -one support from a paraprofessional, as well as modifications to um, educational materials, homework assignments, and testing requirements. I wanted to quickly go over um, different rights that what if your child attends private school? Private schools aren't mandated to provide special education However, if a child is suspected to have a disability, the local public school district is required to evaluate a child if a referral is made. If the evaluation finds them eligible, what's called an instructional school plan or an ISP is developed. Then it's up to the school administrators of the public school to decide what services they will provide. If your child's enrolled in a private school and has a learning disability, you can meet with the special ed director of your public school to find out what special ed services your district is currently offering to private school students. And if it's agreed that services will be provided, um, the public school district must provide it. Typically, these services are much less than those received at public um, schools. And most of these rules are similar to those provided in homeschooling, um, but I'm not going to get into the details of homeschooling just for the sake of time. Now we're going to move into a discussion of advocacy and parent rights in the process. As I mentioned when we were talking about um, initial evaluations, 
When you consent to that initial educational evaluation, you'll receive a copy of procedural safeguards or rights. These should be given to you as well every year after the initial evaluation. Um, these are basically parental rights for special education. These are different from 504 plans. These are rights that are, are available through the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. The first one I want to discuss is prior written notice. You have the right to be given information in writing. Um, and this includes when the school proposes or, or refuses to initiate or change anything related to identification of whether or not your child has a disability or needs special education. Um, you have to receive information in writing or have the right to receive information in writing regarding the evaluation process, such as when an initial evaluation is going to occur, if a reevaluation is going to occur, or if um, the student is being considered for dismissal from special education. You should also receive written prior notice regarding any changements in placement of your child. Um, as well as changes to the IEP or where the IEP will be implemented. It's important to also just remember, as I mentioned earlier, to always request things in writing. Um, that way you can create your own um, paper trail and organize everything and have that um, objective data. Parents also have the right to consent. Um, there's different situations when the school needs to get parental consent, such as before an evaluation. Parents also have the right to independent educational evaluations. We discussed what these are earlier in the presentation. Parents also have rights related to educational records. This is covered under the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. And this is rights related to confidentiality and access to educational records. Parents have the right to inspect and review any and all records that the district keeps. And then parents also have rights related to resolving disagreements. <clears throat> There's particular dispute resolution processes that I'm going to be talking about a little bit in more detail. Um, but if you do have a disagreement, uh, certain rights that you have are to mediation. Um, the IDEA mandates that states have procedures in place to help parents resolve disputes through mediation. Um, mediation helps parents and the school Review disputes to a neutral mediator to help resolve the disagreement. Parents also have the right to make complaints. Um, it's called a complaint resolution. And you can file complaints with the educational agency in your state. And parents also have the right to due process. Um, parents or the school district can request a due process hearing. Um, over a disagreement that they're having. And due process is similar to um, going to court or a legal process. To get in a little bit deeper about disagreements and conflicts, if you disagree with any educational decisions or changes, it's a good idea to schedule an IEP or ARD meeting um, request this in writing. If you disagree during the ARD or IEP meeting, you don't have to sign the IEP and make your disagreements known. If you're having trouble um, advocating for your parental rights or you feel that the school is not following educational law, provide understanding, your own understanding of educational law and what rights are being violated or provide documentation of your educational rights and what's being violated. It's always best to try to problem solve with the IEP team first, express your concerns, see if you can come to an agreement. 
The next steps, if you can't, would be to request mediation, to file a complaint with the educational agency, and then the next step, or the more the final step, would be to request due process, which again is similar to a hearing. Um, when there are disagreements or conflicts between parents and schools, it's really important to um, educate yourself. And when you can, consult with an expert such as an educational advocate. These are people that have understanding of educational law and can help support and advocate for children in special ed. Remember, you as the parent are the expert on your child and their biggest advocate. Um, so it's really important to gain confidence in terms of advocating for your child and speaking up for their needs and voicing when you feel that their needs aren't being met. And again, the more you educate, the more power you'll have, the more confidence. Um, Connect yourself with resources. This is important. Collaborate with the school and providers. It's also a good idea to organize all of the paperwork, to create a paper trail, um, to document, to request things in writing. Um, familiarize yourself with all of the rights. If you don't agree with an evaluation, request an independent educational evaluation. Um, again, find an advocate. See if you can consult with an educational advocate. Um, and remember, if you're not able to come to agreement with your child's special ed team or IEP team, there are steps that you can take um, to continue the process, such as mediation or due process. I'd like to review some resources that I feel are very helpful in terms of understanding educational law. Um, one big one is Rights Law. This is up top here. Um, they have a great informational website and they also have several publications related to educational law. Um, two of them that I really like are Emotions to Advocacy. Um, this book has a lot of great information for parents on advocacy as well as all of the educational law and um, kind of a more understandable interpretation of all of the laws as well. I also like their publication called All About IEPs. And one of them that I referenced earlier was Writing Measurable Goals and Objectives. This is another great resource for um, help with the IEP and writing good goals. And then just back to a few other online resources, um, the National Association of Parents with Children in Special Education. Our resource for finding educational advocates is through the Council of Parents, Attorneys, and Advocates, or COPA. And these also have um, state chapters or agencies. The Texas Education Agency, as well as Disability Rights Texas, these are two, um, since we're in Texas and many of you may be tuning in from Texas, um, these are two good local um, websites that have more information on um, state laws. Okay, so let's see. Good, we have some time for questions before we wrap up. Um, and again, I likely won't get to all of the questions today, um, however, we will review them and we will be able to post follow-up um, blog posts. We can even do a question and answer type style post um, as well as possible um, upcoming webinars if there are any topics that we get a lot of interest in. Okay, I'm just going to re review some of the questions here for a moment. Okay. This question states, my child's 
school wants to put him in a self-contained classroom. What is this? Uh, that's a good question. A self-contained classroom is a term for a type of setting that a child might be placed in or the type of classroom. Um, typically, a self-contained classroom is smaller. Um, it's usually taught by a special education teacher, and it's with other students that have disabilities or differences. Um, so an important thing to consider if a child is determined that the least restrictive environment would be a self-contained classroom is to ask um, what percentage will they have inclusion with typically developing peers. Um, for example, will they be in a self-contained classroom but have inclusion um, during certain classes or during lunch and things like that. Okay, this next question. My child isn't making progress under their current IEP, but since I already signed it, can I change it? Um, that's a good question. It can get tricky with everything that you have to sign, but yes, parents have the right um, to request that the IEP be changed. So um, you want to put a request in in writing um, and indicate what your concerns are in terms of why they aren't making progress. And you want to request um, an IEP meeting, or in Texas, as we call them, an ARD meeting. But yes, just because you sign something doesn't mean you can't um, disagree or change it at a later date. Okay, this next one asks, can you describe mediation more? Okay, good question. Um, Mediation pertains to the resolution process, so that's one of the rights that parents have if they disagree um, with aspects of their child's special ed program. So if there's a disagreement um, and it's not resolved informally through the IEP team, mediation can be requested, and basically Mediation helps both sides, so the parents and the school communicate with the goal of coming up with solutions. It should be a confidential process, and a mediator or a neutral person is available to facilitate the, the process and to help both parties come up with a solution. Again, if mediation doesn't work, there's further steps that can be taken. Um, parents can request a due process hearing they can also make a complaint to their local education agency. Um, this next question asks, can I bring someone with me to my child's IEP or ARD meeting? Um, yes, definitely you can, and it's a good idea. It's a good idea to take someone who knows your child well and can help support you. Um, so yes, you can definitely have a support person there with you. Um, okay, here's another one. Let's see how we're doing on time. Okay. Um, my child's school says that they don't have anyone who specializes in autism, so they can't evaluate. What do I do? Unfortunately, this is something that I've heard before. Um, the school can't deny a service because they don't have it. Um, if it's a service that public schools must provide, if the school doesn't have that service, they have to provide it. So the school must either bring in someone from another district or a specialist to complete the evaluation or they have to pay for an evaluation from, from a private evaluator. But they can't just say, oh, um, we don't have anyone, or we don't have a specialist, so we can't do it. Um, this also pertains to behavioral specialists that might help um, put together a behavioral intervention plan, for example. Um, if the school doesn't have a behavior specialist, they need to bring in someone. Um, if the school doesn't have a speech and language pathologist, but a child uh, needs the related service of speech therapy, they have to bring in someone. Schools can't just say, oh, we don't have that, so we can't provide it. 
Let's see. My school says my son is not is not failing his classes, so the school says he doesn't need an IEP. Is this true? No, this is very false. There's no law that says a child must be failing um, to get special education or accommodations. Um, a child's school or a parent can request an evaluation. So even if your child isn't receiving failing grades, but you're concerned about their educational performance and they're struggling, you can request an, edu an educational evaluation. There's nothing in IDEA that says that they must be um, performing at this low criteria or must be failing. Um, however, it must be determined that the disability or um, impairments are either impacting their academic progress for special education or the impairments are impacting a child's ability to access uh, free and appropriate public education. Okay, here's another question. Um, what are some examples of educational modifications? Uh, that's a really good question. I didn't talk much about modifications in this presentation. I focused more on accommodations. Um, but modifications are also steps that can be taken to help meet the needs of students. So. Um, Modifications mean changes to the typical education environment or curriculum instead of helping a child access them. It's actually changing it. Um, so this might be giving them different work than the other students um, or different homework. They might have less homework or different assignments. Um, or a child might have a different grading procedure compared to other students. Um, so students can have educational modifications to help them succeed as part of special ed and as part of um, Section 504. Let's see, I think we have time for, um, actually it looks like it's about time to wrap up today but like I mentioned any we'll try to get to all questions um, and consolidate them in a future blog post or perhaps a webinar um, but I hope that today it gave you a good sense of what your rights are in special education and what should in, be included in a good IEP or 504 plan um, and additionally, I hope that it's provided you some guidance of where to get additional information. I encourage everyone to follow us on YouTube, um, on our Facebook page, and Twitter. Again, we post all of our webinars on our YouTube channel. There's a lot of great previous webinars. Um, I've done some on the evaluation process. Um, that would be a good one to review um, just in terms of understanding what to look for for a good educational evaluation. Um, but thank you all for your time and attention and um, for being here for the presentation today. <laughs>